an original MCM production. Welcome everybody to our very first um, event from the Confronting Mass Incarceration series that Milwaukee Turners is doing along with um, Boswell Books and multiple community partners. So welcome and spread the word because we have five more coming. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Ju Lily and, and Patricia, and to our host here at uh, MATC. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and we're delighted to be a part of this uh, first in what we hope is an ongoing series uh, of gatherings here and around the city. Uh, my name is Daniel Karpowitz, and uh, I'm coming from the Hudson Valley in New York and a liberal arts college there called Bard College. Uh, as, uh, and my home there is primarily something called the Bard Prison Initiative. And I'll speak about a little bit more about what that is, but essentially it's, it's a college that um, uh, has about 2,000 conventional undergraduates and uh, an additional 350 men and women who uh, attend the college full time while currently incarcerated and then about twice that of alumni around the state of New York and the, and the country uh, thriving in their postgraduate and post-release careers. So um, uh, I'm joined today uh, by a panel uh, of uh, uh, people who each have a, a unique perspective and engagement with the issues of both confronting mass incarceration generally and perhaps to the degree that they choose uh, to speak to the issue, uh, which uh, uh, I think falls certainly to me, at least in part, about this question of where this concept of college or higher education in prison fits within the confrontation uh, uh, with mass incarceration. So I think uh, what we've talked about is that each of us <clears throat> will speak in turn, beginning with Professor Wheelock at the end of the table uh, for five to 10 minutes. Uh, and um, I encourage all of you to, uh, as you're listening to each of us speak in turn, uh, think of questions, uh, the harder the better, uh, and you know, jot them down for your memory, and I'll be doing the same. And so each of us will speak about uh, our work and how it relates to the, to the topic today, and our experience and how it relates to the topic. And uh, I'll end by saying a few things about the issue in general and the work we're doing around the country and perhaps here locally. And then we'll open it up. So hopefully at least half the time together is an open conversation amongst everyone here in the room. Uh, and uh, with that, further ado, uh, I think I'll just uh, uh, run down the list. Um, we have Darren uh, Wheelock. <clears throat> a sociologist and professor from Marquette University is joining us. Larry Cote, a local attorney uh, and who's involved in a number of areas of civic activism that touch on this issue more broadly. Uh, James Watkins, thank you, uh, who's joining us on the panel today, and myself, Daniel Karpowitz. And that's it. So, uh, Darren, if you'll sure. get us started, please. Thank you. Um, Daniel asked me to say a few words about just the concept of mass incarceration and then talk some about my work. Um, so criminologists, criminologists and sociologists have, uh, we generally attribute the term itself to an individual by the name of David Garland, who studies the sociology of punishment. And somewhere around 2000, 2001, he coined the term mass incarceration, which we have used to describe our current state of imprisonment. Um, and there's different dimensions and different sides to it. Some people just take the very literal uh, prison population and jail population, merge that together, you get the imprisonment rate and what happened to that over the past 40 years or so. Um, back in the early 70s, the rate was about 150, 160, 170 per 100,000. And then in 2007, 2008, I believe it peaked at about 750 per 100,000, which is an increase of about 470%. The popular, the Prison population itself increased something 
along the lines of 700%. One's the rate, one's the overall population. And we saw Wisconsin's incarceration rate also increase over that period, increasing somewhere in the area of 900% between the 70s and the early to mid 2000s. And um, so that's just the population itself, which people oftentimes will focus on. But there's other components to what people that study mass incarceration also will examine, which include uh, the occurrence of prison within an individual's life throughout the course of their life course events. For example, now incarceration imprisonment is as common as college and military for certain segments of the population, particularly young African American men without a college degree. And that's, I'll be kind of bringing this back to Daniel's point about the importance of college and the way that it can insulate individuals as well as uh, very likely reduce recidivism on the back end. Um, and people have examined the impact of incarceration on African American communities, on uh, poor communities, and others still have examined the role of politics and policies in contributing to mass incarceration. Uh, the, um, what has led to this drastic increase is complicated, and it, there's a lot of different policies. For example, mandatory minimums, truth and sentencing laws, that's probably Wisconsin's primary issue, and um, through strikes laws, that was a big issue in California. But there was a series of legislative moves that happened in the primarily 80s, early 90s that really contributed to mass incarceration. What's really interesting is that while all the while politicians and political leaders were arguing to get tough on crime, not a single one were saying, we have a good idea, let's increase incarceration rate by a factor of five. We think that's a good idea. What it was, it was these appeals to public safety, appeals to doing something about um, unwanted elements of society, and through then the policies that were implemented, what the result was, was an increase in imprisonment rate, something of about almost a factor of five. Um, many criminologists and sociologists then started taking note. I would say in the 90s where you really started seeing work where people started thinking to themselves, this is a problem, like something's really happening here. Um, sociologists and criminologists for decades, uh, 70, 80 years, knew that criminal punishment and criminal justice and contact with those institutions was not generally a good thing. That bad results tended to happen. Labeling, stigma, shaming, uh, loss of bonds and to families and communities. But back in the 70s and 60s and before mass incarceration, it was an event that happened rarely enough that no one really gave it that much attention. No one thought it was that serious because it was, oh, that's a marginal problem because not that many people are affected by it. But then with the advent of mass incarceration, we started seeing, wow, the more that people are affected by the negative and adverse impact of contact with that system, then people started paying attention to, well, one, what led to the mass, of, what led to mass incarceration? And then uh, mid to late 90s, people started examining, well, what is the impact of this? And I had the fortune of studying with a sociologist by the name of Chris Hugan at the University of Minnesota, who was one of the first wave of scholars to take seriously that question of how can we understand the impact of mass incarceration on social institutions. He focused primarily on voting and civic engagement. And our work together led me to start thinking, well, this is a widespread problem. You could imagine how it could affect education, employment, and a number of social institutions because the numbers themselves, the raw numbers, have gotten so high that now we're looking at over 2.2-ish million people in prison and jails. And if you also include the, um, the population of individuals that have served their sentence but now have to na navigate life with a felony conviction, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 million Americans now are either uh, currently under paper or have finished their sentence and now have to live life the rest of their life navigating um, with a criminal record. So my work now, um, much of my work, my earlier work was focused on the collateral consequences because there is also laws that prohibit individuals with felony convictions from engaging in a whole range of activities. I mentioned voting is one, but it's definitely not the only one. Another one is that oftentimes individuals with felony convictions, uh, particularly the drug convictions, can either lose or are unable to receive federal grant for school or, or higher education. 
They can uh, lose the ability to secure public housing. Um, they can also uh, be prohibited from or restricted from holding a number of different occupations depending upon the state and the offense type. So there's a whole range of, of restrictions that activates uh, the moment an individual is uh, convicted of a felony. And that's not even if they go to prison or not. Right? This is just a felony conviction, and those consequences will activate for that individual. Um, and so a lot of my work that will focus on the collateral consequences. More recently, my work has shifted to examine public opinion for criminal punishment. Um, I currently work with Michael, Professor Michael O'Hear at the Marquette Law School. And we are working with Charles Franklin, who's the director of the Marquette Law School poll. And we're trying to assess what public opinion is regarding um, rehabilitation, truth in sentencing. Are there any avenues, any types of arguments that can be formed that can start to that uh, politicians and policy leaders can think of that might resonate with the public? Um, and real briefly, uh, what we find is that the public is in general very supportive of rehabilitation efforts, right? Unfortunately, they're also really supportive of enhanced punishment, right? They're, so it's a fairly punitive public, but there is this space to support rehabilitation efforts. And I think uh, approached properly, that, that support can be utilized to start to um, generate uh, more broad support for programs such as the BART initiative and other similar types of programs. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks. All right. uh, good afternoon. I'm Larry Cote. Um, I think as Dan stated earlier, I'm a local attorney here. I've been in practice for about 20 years. And my, um, as I was thinking about what I could actually add to this panel discussion, I'm not a scholar, you know, like some of the people sitting up here at the table today. I'm a practitioner within the system. And I began practicing at a time when a lot of the changes, not all the ones that have resulted in these trends, started to take shape, whether it was the changes in truth and sentencing, and the implementation of truth and sentencing in Wisconsin, the changes that have been made, the uh, budgetary considerations, um, as well as somebody that had to function within that changing system. So I've represented individuals, and, and I've seen firsthand those impacts on these individuals. Um, how it affects them, their families, and their extended families, and um, long-term implications of that. So, I mean, from a very sort of nuts and bolts perspective, you know, I see those one-on-one -on -one things. In, in my other role, I, I work with the Felmer's Cheney Advocacy Board, and I've been a long-term member of that board. I sit on the executive committee. And in that role, we actually do take a look at these various policy considerations and then pursue change. Okay, um, pursue change oftentimes from within that system. And whether it's working with something like the BPI project to try and make changes within Wisconsin's correction system, or um, advocating for change in the way that we handle our probation and parole in the state, these, these are issues that uh, Felm FCAB, Felmer's Chain Advocacy Board, works on. And so I guess I was hoping that in my role here tonight as a panelist, that really we could have some dialogue that would be initiated. Uh, we, I think if you look at the experiences at the table, there's a broad base, and this is a complex issue, and there isn't a magic bullet to solve that problem. So for, again, from my perspective, knowing what individuals that are interested enough to come here tonight and listen to us speak about some of these things, what they want to know, what they're interested in, I feel like that's what I could contribute to and answer some of those, you know, frontline type questions. So, thanks for hearing me out. Thanks. James? Um, hello, my name is James Watkins. I'm here as a representative of Expo, which is an organization of ex-prisoners organizing to bring attention to, to issues uh, of mass incarceration and conditions within the, the prisons. Uh, I did 24 years in the prison, and I'm a recipient of education in prison. Uh, while I was there, not only did I educate myself as much as I can and go to college, I read like uh, over a thousand books. I don't know, just stop counting. Mostly nonfiction, because one thing I didn't have in my home was books. And one thing my friends didn't have in their home was books. One thing we didn't talk about was books. We had Ebony, 
Chat. So we seen the beauty of the week every week. <laughs> I'm sad. <laughs> All right, Chat, Ebony, and occasionally somebody come and sell my mother, grandma, some encyclopedias. Now, it was encyclopedias everywhere, but they was just unread. So when I got to prison, I said, well, I'm going to do what my friends can't do. I'm going to read and I'm going to go to school. Now, you can attack this mass incarceration from plenty areas. You can attack it from the family area. Uh, what does it do when the male in the family is taken away? Or the son who might have been a protector and he probably provided some type of income to help support the family? Or just his presence? Uh, you can attack it from economics. The economics is from the person who uh, get a search warrant or the police who pull you over, the people who do intake, the lawyer, the PDs who get paid for you, the public defender, the prosecutor who get paid, the court stenographer, everybody's getting paid. So who would want to go against the system? Right, it's only cut their own foot. The, the, the correctional officer, the warden, who want to say this ain't working? and stop their own check. OK, you can attack it from that. Uh, you can attack it from a TV standpoint, where you talk about public opinion. Uh, my parents, they love Perry Mason. <laughs> but ain't no Perry Masons around here. Every show is sold from the prosecutor's point of view. Every show is the prosecutor. CSI, every show is the prosecutor. And at the end, the person get caught. And 45 minutes, they get caught. That's not true. <laughs> it's, it's not true. And then from another thing, which I'm saying, the data shows violent crime has been going down since 1972. And a thing they consider violent crime is still in the car. That's a violent crime with nobody in it. So it's been going down, but the, the time has been going up. The mandatory minimum, I'm talking about it's easy to make a distraction and, 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 and not represent your platform if you're a political person or you run for political office and just say, we need to get tough on crime. Everybody's for tough on crime. <laughs> but who they getting tough on crime for? Right, they come in our communities getting tough on crime. Now, it's other communities, they do just stuff, they just hide it and it's quieter, but they not kicking in their doors. I read a book, I forgot his name, uh, he was a sociologist from Chicago, and he told a story about uh, p people who went through the police academy. One of them was a black, a black person, African-American. He graduated at the top of his class. So he went to a nice neighborhood. When he met up with the other people in his class, they was like, man, what's going on? Uh, how you doing? We wish we was you. He said, man, I wish I was y'all. He said, why? He said, ain't no fun over here. Over here, they tell you what to do. Get the cat out the tree. It, they, he got to be officer friendly in their neighborhood, but in our neighborhood, they paramilitary. You know what I'm saying? They got folks to a car, bulletproof vest, they jumping out, they disrespectful, they beating people, and all that type of stuff. Also, this person mentioned that um, by the age of 13, especially like places like Chicago, you know what I'm saying, probably here now, we condition, we already know when the police, we know soon the position, we'd have been in the police car and all that. And his assumption was they're trying to kill us either for political office or a Fortune 500 company. Once you get the stigma, you like Kang, you mark for life. And you can never change, never, ever change. And, and you can never say I'm a changed person. They always going to refer back to what you was com uh, convicted of or 9 times out of 10 copped out for a plea bargain. For, and the, my biggest thing, into, uh, currently I'm, I'm, I'm here at MATC doing a double major, um, liberal arts and, <laughs> and horticulture landscaping, but it, it, it has, I'm, on, I'm on my last classes and it's, 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 it's very rough. But uh, <laughs> the, the thing is, when I did get out, I had two problems, housing. Now, you can, they can discriminate, and there's no problem. Nobody really talks about this. You can go tell them, look, I got the security, and I got the rent for two months, but after they run the application, you check that box, even if they took your money. For <laughs> I'm talking about I had a, a rough time until somebody just said, I know somebody and the landlord, and maybe he'll give you a spot. It wasn't in the best neighborhood. Like, people with uh, 
felonies and whatever, they like keep it between one neighborhood, between like 25th and 35th and Will, Highland, all, all that. Them, they, they keep us right there. You try to go out the venture, it, it's very hard unless somebody else sign it for you. Uh, I don't know. I have some more to say, but uh, I'm just waiting for y'all questions. I'm ready. And then, like, like, and um, you got two camps. You got the the real politic. You got the conservative camp who's saying if you educate him, you're only gonna make him a better criminal. He's gonna be more calculated, get away with more stuff. And you got the, the liberal part that say if you educate a man, then you'll give him more tools, and he don't have to do that. I'm more the product of the liberals. You know what I'm saying? Liberals tend conservatives who think like that none today. You know what I'm talking about? So I'm gonna pass it off. But we're not done here. We are going to reserve most of our time precisely for those questions uh, that people can ask you and that we can engage with as a group. So uh, mm -hmm. I'll also keep it. Julie, what's, when, when, is, when is the final bell ring for us so, so I can help I manage the time? I think the very latest is an hour from now. Okay, great. Lots, plenty of time. Okay. <clears throat> so. Uh, um, uh, uh, we've heard some references across uh, uh, the group so far about uh, individual experiences with or research about this phenomenon that we've been living through for the past well, now two generations that has come to be called mass incarceration. I just wanted to allude and put out there on the table some of the uh, uh, other work about the why that's out there. A lot of us will have heard uh, and may engage ourselves in, in, in attempts to answer that, that question, why? And I thought I would just, on behalf of the panel, put some of them out there uh, in case we want to return to that. And I think, I think it would be important to acknowledge them. So, uh, and also to remind you now at this point that the next panel that we'll have will be uh, featuring a book by an historian of the United States. Uh, whose book, Get Tough, is an attempt by an historian to understand the why. Uh, it's a study that focuses on the late 1970s and 80s. Just as we are entering into this period in earnest, lots of changes going on in the country in the late 1970s and the 1980s. They're affecting almost every aspect of American life. Uh, the, um, and one of them is this punitive turn the advent of uh, public sentiments for greater punishment, uh, as well as the policies that have uh, disparate and some concentrated that lead to the results that we now call mass incarceration, which Darren uh, summarized so effectively. Um, <clears throat> some people who do work on that area are trying to ask that question why, right? Uh, they're looking to, different, very different arguments are given. And I just want to say from the outset, they need not be mutually exclusive, meaning there can be multiple theories we have here trying to answer the why. And they may sound very different, but life is complicated. And they are not necessarily, social scientists and scholars will argue as if they're mutually exclusive. They may not be. There may be multiple reasons for how we get into this mess. So some people will suggest uh, that you know what we were living through in a country in the 70s and 80s were profound structural shifts in the economy and the geographical dis distribution of poverty and who was being, who, what were the loss of jobs and how were they distributed racially uh, by communities and by geography and how that in turn affected the way the dominant ideologies about the government, what the government could do, uh, the way the government could be a solution to the problem, <coughs> problems or the way the government was a source of problems. Uh, and some have argued, uh, I think in, in very interesting ways that uh, one of the things that brought us to this was a sense that uh, perhaps the last way the government could enact its power was through punishment, was through punitiveness. And one of the things I was struck by in Darren, some of Darren's work, and I was reading through some of the polling that's going on at MU, is the deeply partisan divide over punitiveness. Right? That we all know that, right? That the political divides that we live in the country correlate <coughs> very strongly with attitudes towards punishment and also towards pessimism about government and pessimism about the state, and that among our most hostile partisans attacking the state, the last remaining power of the state that is endorsed is the power to punish, the power to inflict pain. And that also correlates, in fascinating ways, I think I'll hazard this, with different experiences with the criminal justice system, 
and of victimization, and that's something I'd love to sort of ask Darren uh, about later, is you know, people who are most punitive, if I, this, tell me if this is correct, that, that, that um, high degrees of punitiveness correlate with relatively low levels of actually having experienced victimization. And I think that's fascinating. So uh, uh, maybe we can return to that. So that's one set of questions that focus on economic change, job loss, attitudes toward the state. Another school of thought looks at this very differently and thinks as of, in, in some ways, certainly rhetorically, as the fourth peculiar institution of the country, right? That this is, as most recently is called, right, the new Jim Crow. Many of you must be familiar with that analysis. And in that, it's understood in part as a backlash against the civil rights movement and the civil rights era that preceded it. Okay, that's a very different kind of analysis as to how or why we got here. I think I wanted to just for the group put them out there. We know they're out there, we ought to name them. <clears throat> and I for one certainly don't think those two broad views are mutually exclusive, they may be uh, interrelated. So um, with that, I'll just say a few words about uh, the book and, and, and my work. So uh, maybe more about my work. Um, <clears throat> Uh, 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 college, uh, higher education was a structural feature of the landscape of American prisons, at least from the passage of the Higher Education Act, <coughs> Higher Education Act in the 1960s through the mid-1990s. And one of the signal features of the Higher Education Act was uh, uh, the Pell Grants. I would assume most, if not all of us, or nearly all of us in this room when we went to college, went with a Pell Grant in hand, that our households qualified as uh, entitled us to a federal subsidy to go towards tuition. <clears throat> uh, from the 60s, and especially in the 70s and 80s, in part due to the mobilization of demands from people who were at the time incarcerated, were demanding college to be brought inside prisons as part of of the conditions of confinement. And the third speaker in this series will be Heather Ann Thompson, uh, whose Pulitzer Prize winning book is a history of the rebellion at Attica and its repression, both at the time and in historical memory uh, in New York. Uh, but one of those demands coming out of Attica was for college and prison, for higher educational opportunity uh, inside that New York system. And that was successful. There were a lot of successes that uh, Thompson might discuss when she's here that came out of that, that rebellion or that uh, the attic experience. So it was a structural feature. By that I mean in every prison in New York, there was a college, at least one, public and often private. So in New York, you had the SUNY system, the state universities of New York, and you had a number of mission-driven Catholic schools or small liberal arts colleges that had college prison programs. They were, uh, the more education you had in the state, Generally, the more likely they had colleges and prisons, colleges functioning and flourishing inside their prisons. When Congress debated the, the, the uh, crime bill of 1994, which uh, was a lightning rod of controversy in our last presidential campaign, <clears throat> uh, it was the first major bill put by the Republican House to the Clinton administration to sign. Um, I will go out on a limb and say something nice about the Clintons, that when Bill Clinton signed it, he said, uh, there are some good ideas in this law wrapped in a giant uh, bag of horse shit. And one of the pieces of horse shit was the revocation of Pell eligibility for people in prison. Right? So in that punitive turn, one of the things that were done, they didn't cut budgets on policing. They didn't cut budgets on prisons. They didn't even cut budgets on programming in prison at the congressional and state levels, but they did cut college. That was the most offensive thing, was the idea that there would be college inside. And um, as a result, these programs collapsed. So in New York, where you had 70 different prisons uh, with a, some kind of college or university functioning inside of them, within six months, uh, you had half a dozen. And within three years, you had uh, really one, a guy who had, uh, in upstate New York near Buffalo who had squirreled away with dubious, you know, good values and dubious uh, <clears throat> uh, accounting, squirreled away enough money to keep the program going for a number of years, uh, even after the funding was cut. Uh, so uh, the, my small college and a group of students at that college organized a college and prison program that started with Bard College credit in 2001. The campus has 2,000 students. 
uh, conventional students on the main campus, and today an additional 300, uh, and sometimes as many as 350, men and women who are currently incarcerated who attend Bard College classes full time while they're incarcerated. There is no endowment, there is no public funding, and there is no tuition. So we have to go out and raise money for full scholarship for those programs. Uh, they are liberal arts programs. I would love to, one of the questions I had for James is to tell us about, you know, he's pursuing a trade here, he's pursuing a vocation, and he's pursuing the liberal arts. I'd love to hear about that because part of the questions around these works is, do we have a choice to make? Don't we have to have to make a choice? Don't we have to confront students with a choice? You study liberal arts, uh, sometimes depending on who you are, or who your parents are, or you learn a trade. And that's a choice that we reject out of hand for ourselves, for our college, for our students. And I'd love to hear more about uh, your choices in that regard. So uh, today, uh, right, we have, these are students, they're thriving, they're getting A's, B.A.s, often going on to graduate schools. The goal is a post-release life that is uh, for people who have been in prison, uh, who have particularly done significant times in prison, but a post-graduate and post-release career that is commensurate with having gone to a great college. Uh, and uh, while the recidivism is low, extraordinarily low, does anyone know that, everyone know what that term means, right? Getting out of prison and then being sent back. <clears throat> we don't care. There is no self-respecting college or university in the country that cares about the recidivism of its alumni. Okay, so one of the themes for me that's important in doing this work is to protect the college inside the prison from becoming a feature of the prison, from becoming a criminal justice program. It's not, or it shouldn't be. It should be an attempt of America's colleges and universities to fulfill their mission to find great students everywhere because they are everywhere and at different times in their lives and fulfill the mission of American higher education. It is not, it is important for criminal justice policy maybe, but it's desperately important for American educational policy. So um, uh, the last thing I'll say is that we're, we are active now in about a dozen states around the country helping other mm -hmm. colleges and universities do what the state used to do, do what our, the US Treasury and the Department of Education used to do, which is mobilize private money for the public good and build colleges and university opportunities inside uh, uh, for people who are brilliant students and full of, full of talent and ambition and will otherwise not have access to, to great schools. So we do that with Wesleyan University in Connecticut, with Grinnell in Iowa, with Goucher College in Baltimore, uh, with Yale now University in Connecticut as well, with University of Vermont, uh, our first public university, Minnesota State University, our second uh, public state university. Um, uh, um, Wash U nearby in St. Louis and a partnership between Notre Dame and the Holy Cross College at Notre Dame in South Bend. All of those are partnerships uh, with the same vision, uh, a combination of liberal arts and careers for uh, people that um, you know, bring to great students the, the best of what the country sort of has to offer in higher education. So we're active, we, we are active here in the city uh, and, and um, okay, this is a bit of a, pitch, I suppose, uh, you know, we'd love to do something like that here. And we have encountered, we've been invited here, uh, uh, I think initially by FCAB, uh, and to see if, if something might uh, be possible. And so I'm very happy to be here at this event and to, to be with all of you all. And um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, impatient to get something started and, uh, and prepared to go, uh, you know, not go anywhere, very stubborn. We need a combination of impatience and stubbornness. So uh, desperate to get started and not going anywhere quickly. It'll take a long time for us to be chased out of town and not do something with all the great colleges and universities you have within this metropolitan area to do something. So that's it. Um, thank you. Uh, so I think we have a, quite a bit of good time for a, a, a public and group conversation. Um, I'm going to do, I think, my last sort of major thing is just to ask the first question, and I'll ask it of James, which I've foreshadowed already. Uh, uh, I'm really particularly interested, and in, I have to deal a lot with people uh, uh, telling me and my students, our students, uh, that uh, uh, poor people and poor people who are incarcerated uh, don't need the liberal arts, uh, that that's for <coughs> fancy kids uh, at fancy colleges, that's for the 1%. 
uh, or some other percent, whatever percent they imagine. Uh, and I'd love to hear you know, your thoughts about that. First of all, I think in the early, late 18, early 1900, <laughs> when they thought about what would be a Western education, they put the great book series together, and which was is a liberal arts, uh, which, is, which is for liberal arts. Mm -hmm. So colleges started when it, uh, for enlightenment. Mm -hmm. After you read this, you get a little this, a little this. You can say you educated with a, a Western education. Mm -hmm. So it started with liberal arts. Later on, the Booker T. Washington came along and said, well, you should teach them how to till the land and all this. Well, him and W.D. Du Bois, they had their little thing they about that and, about and that. liberal arts. And, um, you know, the liberal arts is, is right to teach you to enlighten yourself, and that way you can be a better human being to other human beings as well as the planet and within the animals, the environment, and everything like that. Now, of course, you got to eat <laughs> as well. <laughs> So I think the argument about the time when I was, when I started to take a, a, a trade, which is which horticulture, mm -hmm. was that people are looking for more specialized people. They're not looking for nobody with a bachelor's degree in general education. He can be taught, but it's going to take longer. They want somebody mm -hmm. can get in the field and, and do what they need mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. So the reason why I took the, to tell you the truth, the reason why I took the class is because it was the only one offered at the time, and I got it in prison. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you started so, with that curriculum in, while you were incarcerated? Yeah, uh -huh. I got a certificate in horticulture. Okay. I'm just uh, further so I can get a degree in landscaping as well. So I'm talking about I took the class, and right, I drag. Everybody always said it's the flower power class, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> hey, this weight lifting and all this, and I'm taking, they see me around the, the prison planting flowers and doing this, mm -hmm. and they <laughs> said, flower power, look, hey, look, hey, look, don't worry about it, it's okay. It's better than being on unassigned. <laughs> unassigned is a wing where everybody is unassigned, they don't got jobs, so you hear checkers and cars and what LeBron James did, and it would drive you crazy. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, when I got out, I, I got out, I had 97 credits, and there, just like what he said, the Pell Grant was gone, and they said, and, and they started charging you $2,000 for a liberal arts degree. So the teacher said, look, why don't you take every class and get all the requirements except one? So that way you can keep on taking more classes and more now classes. Now you're getting your faculty in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know which one. <laughs> take more classes and more classes, and then when you get out, you just take the one class, and uh, you got a degree. Well, it didn't work like that. I got here at MATC, I had 97 credits. When they got through vetting me, I had 27. <laughs> <laughs> we only accepted 27. So I'm like, oh, 27? So for the, the first year, I did enlightenment. I said, I'm going to do liberal arts. And then I said, forget that. I can read my own book. Look, I need a trade. <laughs> So I, I, I chose, I said, I already got a horticulture certificate, why not just get the degree? So I, I chose, and, and that's how that happened. Now, in the short run, the technical degree is, 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 or certificate is, is more functional. In the long run, the liberal arts is more functional because it allows you to move up the ladder in the trade to management and stuff, and stuff like that. Because you, if you don't got the piece of paper, then you're you probably going to be stuck. You're probably the best in the company, but since you don't got no credentials, you don't move nowhere. Okay, I read another book. I told you I read over a thousand now. <laughs> hey, uh, this, this one person said, in the olden days, in the real olden days, they said uh, the rites of passage was after you go chase a buffalo or a lion, tiger, bear, whatever, and you do what you're supposed to do, you come back. And then, you know, you get your stripes, uh, your feather, whatever, then that makes you an adult in society. But he said, in the modern times, what makes you an adult in society is the piece of paper, the certificate, the degree, and it says, okay, now you're the adult in society. So it'll get you the job. It might not keep you with the job. So, uh, Thank you. All right. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to open it up. Let's start with, with folks in the audience if there's... If, there, it gets, if it gets quiet, I'm warning you, I ha, I'll, I, it gives me an opportunity to ask more questions. So, uh, gentleman in the back and then the woman, is that, was that a hand up in the back, sir, in the green sweater? 
OK, so first we'll start here, and then we'll go. Yes, sir? Yeah. I've been free for four years. Great, right? Well, that's, I'm talking about that's good that it inspired you to do more, but they really didn't tell me that because my history in prison is different. I did like half of that time, like maybe about 12 years in, the, in, in, in segregation. And that's for guards who asked a little bit too aggressive or said a little bit too much to me. And then, right, so they didn't tell me that. I'm, like, Y'all want me to keep it real. That's what happened. I did a lot of time in segregation because, uh, yeah, but I'm just saying, it's, it's just like when, when, they, when somebody take on a uniform, they take on the soul of that uniform, they stop being individuals. You know what I'm saying? The blue coat, the silence, and they just do the will of whatever uniform. It's like having on a mask. They just do that will, and you stop being an individual to them. Like some people, you can tell how this go. The people who got mail frequently, visits frequently, the guards treated them a little bit more respectful. Hmm. But the people who didn't get mail, who didn't get visits, they treated them any kind of way. You know what I'm saying? In that sense. But I'm pretty, most people, I, since I had been there so long, they was like, look, we hope you don't come back. <laughs> hey, look, hey, look. So that's what they were telling me. <laughs> All right. uh, another question, What did you think of the quality of programming? Well, I'm you think you could come up with something better? I, I, I don't got no money. I don't got no money. They see blueprint nuts. Not kids coming out of college asking them what they do. They should be asking us, what did it take for us to change? And you, they still got to be a little judgmental. You're still fresh. And they're going to be judgmental. Okay. But so what about us that have been free for 12 years so you got a so you got a question or a platform? <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I don't got no money to fund no college. I don't have that. And anytime it was always like an opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of waking up eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday instead of go left waste or just like or go to class for a three hour class, what's the opportunity cost? So is the opportunity cost, is it to take a job and work in an industry that make maybe one to $300 a month versus go to school, which they only pay you like $15 a month? What's the opportunity cost? So it was always when the opportunity cost and going to school paid off versus a job on the gallery, mopping the gallery every day just so I can get a shower. I'm saying every day because they ain't give you showers like every day. So I always like a way to cop opportunity cost. And, and, and a classroom, a college classroom was the only place that I felt, I felt like I was on, on pace with the rest of the world. And in this, they had a civilian attitude versus the rest of the prison. You know what I'm saying? Rest of the prison got, look, you do this or, or, or punishment a ticket, we're gonna take commissary, this or that, this or that, this or that. In the college thing, we can discuss ideals, they can, they civilians, they coming from the world, I'm saying, and I love, you know what I'm saying, so I just, I just love coming to school, cause, cause in prison, the thing they do now, if they need somebody uh, uh, who work in a cafeteria, a, a cook or something like that, they don't hire none from out. They take an officer and say, okay, you're gonna be a cook for the next six months because it's needed. And then after that six months, you go back to being an officer and you need to close the room, you know. So at first, when I first got locked up, it was civilians doing this stuff. Now it's all this or that. Everywhere you go, you cannot shake this attitude. You can't shake this attitude. And the only way I was able to shake the attitude and have some ease was in the classroom. And thank all the college teachers who came in. So first off, I'd like to say that MATC is the recipient of a Second Chance Pell Grant, uh -huh. and we're one of 69 colleges across the country that have five years to you know, start a program in the Wisconsin State Prisons, which we have. And I was hired as an Associate Dean in Liberal Arts and Sciences to help make that happen. And so I have an idealistic question. This is a, a new program in this form for MATC. If you were to have the opportunity and be able to stand in my shoes, and this is similar to the question that was just asked of James, uh, what strategies would you take? We're doing an 
online delivery versus a face-to-face. -face. Which classes are the most important? We're looking at a liberal arts and sciences curriculum. What strategies are the most effective? First of all, online is great because when I came out, I, I'm talking about, like I told you, I got on academic probation because I couldn't type. I don't know nothing about Blackboard. I don't know nothing. I'm saying it's, it was for every day I had to get up and, and use the computer. The night before, I felt like I was going to be in a fight. You know what I'm saying? My stomach messed up, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, cause I got, cause you can hit one button and all your stuff gone, you can't find it back, you somewhere else. I'm talking about right, and I was just swamped. And I had people, I, on the bus ride home, I asked somebody, can I use your phone? Cause they let me out early so I can call. So he let me use his phone, I called, it, then he, I gave it back to him, he gave it back to him. I called, I said, man, what you doing? I couldn't even dial. I couldn't even, I ain't know to push the little the, uh, green thing for dial. I'm saying, right. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even know how to dial. I'm talking about computers still give me a, a wheezy stomach to a certain degree. So, right, I just, online is good, but for them to see people where they can interact back and forth is good. Is, is, is both of them good? Uh, both of them good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to do a this or that. I would try to in, uh, do both of them in some form or fashion, not a this or that, because they need that. Because when you get out, it's like people who get out and commit more crime. It ain't like it's out there a substantial amount of time. They don't want to do more crime, but they don't have no tools. Especially say, well, you got to go do the application online. It's over. Look, hey, look, hey, look. Let me call my man. Look, you still doing it? May I follow up with that as well? So, uh, congratulations on the being one of 69. Uh, Bard is a fellow Second Chance Pell institution, as are. Uh, six of the other consortium members in the BARD program. So we've helped start programs around the country. Half a dozen of them are second chance Pell grantees. We have a very disproportionate number of those Pell grantees. I would uh, emphasize and, un and even go further than James did. Um, uh, uh, first of all, there is no choice here unless we comply with the prison system imposing that choice on us. There is no choice between computer literacy or computer mastery, frankly, computer science, which is uh, a subject you can study with Bard College and prison, uh, and, uh, uh, and college and prison. There, there is no need. Uh, the, the prison system is in control of that decision, not educators. So there is every reason you can have uh, college uh, MATC uh, be uh, with teachers inside coming and going. And for us, um, uh, you know, that is the absolutely essential feature is the traffic in, I mean, you know, James earlier said, people who don't have visitors are subject to more abuse. They're more isolated, they're more vulnerable, and it allows the, it, it encourages or empowers the system to prey upon them. Uh, we think that the, Bard College sends now currently, I think in this semester, 70 different professors in every week to prisons in New York, driving back and forth from campus to the prison. We take over parts of that prison and turn them into college campuses. Uh, and in the middle of it, um, there's a local area network that the college has built. 70 computers, uh, local area network, terabyte upon terabyte of memory. So guys, as cut off as they are, you know, they do the Der Spiegel in German online. You know, they do Mathematica. They do their math training, you know, on the local area network. So you can do that. But I have to say one of the problems with Second Chance Pell as it was structured by the Department of Education was they did not empower schools like yours to make demands of the Department of Corrections so that you could not be cho told you have to choose, but you can say, no, I want both. And you know, that is what, we need that political will, and as educators, we need that political will. Of course people need computers. Of course they need computer literacy and beyond computer facility. And if they're good at computer science, let them major in computer science. We'll do that. We have to build that. But the, that is more disruptive of the daily life of the prison. Mm -hmm. Right? The college, this is my, if I have one mantra from this book, the college that goes inside the prison and fits comfortably in the workings of the prison has squandered a terrible opportunity. And I'm frustrated with the Second Chance Pell program for not having said with their 50 million, they had 50, it's our 50 million, of course, they had our 50 million concentrated in the, in the Second Chance Pell program. And they didn't say to the department, if you want to have our jewel, MATC, come in, you're, they're going to dictate the terms, the faculty and the administration. And the, the, you know, we, had a, we had a computer scientist here earlier on the faculty, your teacher. Uh, 
Uh, is it Michael? Uh, I don't know his name. It's Milton? Milton. Milton. Milton, yeah, that's, I always ask him his name when we in class. Uh, <laughs> uh, Milton, Milton Bond. Mr. Bond. Yeah. Okay, so Professor Bond was here earlier, right? He could have said, you know, he, the Department of Ed could have empowered you and your faculty, like M Professor Bond, to say, this is how we're going to do computer science. This is how we're going to do STEM. This is how we're going to do math literacy. Uh, but they didn't. And I think that's a lost opportunity. So I would encourage you, and you know, we'll talk about it afterwards if you want, is how to negotiate. <laughs> how to negotiate these terms. You have some leverage. You have a Department of Ed grant. You have money. You have access. You have attention from, you know, although that's always a mixed bag in, in our line of work. Uh, but I would be happy to talk about that because you don't, you shouldn't have to make that choice uh, or have that imposed on you by the prison system. You should be disrupting the order of business. And the way to do that is you know, what I heard James saying, and I'd you know, like to hear your print later. You know, it's, it's creating a space inside that prison that the students own with their faculty. Um, and they become, you know, you create. Well, you know. I'm talking where I was, the college that I was in, like, we would go to the greenhouses and we would grow uh, flowers from seedlings, and we would send them to all the state houses. Hmm. I'm talking, about, and we would do all the landscaping around the prison. Mm -hmm. So right, they benefited. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Also that, but and, uh, and uh, one thing else I wanted to say about the person who don't got nobody writing him or something like mm -hmm. that. Yes, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And right now, the prisons under the word security have absolute power for everything. And we need to like. All right, revisit this, and they're trying to do it for the society as, as well. Security just trump everything. Yep. Civil liberties, everything. And if we keep going for that, hey, we're going to go for fried ice cream. Well, he the, he the moderator. Please. Is that a question? Uh, uh, someone, I don't, I think I got mine wrong. Oh, okay. Okay, hi everybody, yes. I'm Alpha, I'm James' wife. Um, to her question, um, I was wondering, is it a issue, is it an issue with uh, prisoners being able to use computers or can you create um, the curriculum where there are like these computers that are like dummy computers where they can communicate just within the prison system and where they're not communicating outside of? the prison system so that, that they're getting that experience writing letters or creating PowerPoints and all of those um, those skills that will prepare them for the real world or for jobs and things like that. But that, that they don't have to do it with someone that's outside of the prison system. Well, uh, before I left prison, they had just took the computer program in class. They had take, just took that. And they took the business management class. So the only thing was left up, you work with your hands, construction, this and that, this and that. And in the computer class, you couldn't actually get on the internet. You can only do the work. You can only, only do the stuff related to the work. You couldn't get on the internet. And as far as computers, we had typewriters. And, uh, and we had um, typewriters. What happened to typewriters had memories. So you would type your stuff and you can save your, you can save your stuff on your typewriter. What happened, they came and took every typewriter out and said, you have to just either send it home or we're going to destroy it. And you can buy this with no memory or, or stuff like that. So uh, I'm saying it's a fine line with them. Even though nothing had never been done with the typewriter that had memory, is that they just came. The biggest thing is like music, like from uh, tapes to CDs. Right. That, some, the guards petitioned against it. Well, we can't have, but the federal joint got CD. The state can't have CD. So, right, we still listen to music from 1972. If, if I may, and then if you want to speak to this. So the short answer is, I mean, there's, there are two parts that I'm hearing to this answer, which I could add to, is technically there's no problem at all. The short answer to your question is yes. Uh, there's no end to the kind of controls uh, for better and for worse, that can be placed on uh, that machinery and that technology. Uh, and it happens in prisons all across the country. So it's a local political decision. It's not a technical problem. It's a local political decision. Does that sound and right? The state um, prisons that we're working with, they have computer labs, they have Chromebooks, and so they're mainly using Google Apps. 
so they're not necessarily the full-blown Microsoft Office products, but very, very similar. And so they're able to learn that. I think each um, inmate, which I call students, each student has a flash drive, so they can actually save their own work. So it's pretty, pretty good. Uh, there was a question here in the corner and then in the back. Was there two in the back? Yeah, so gentlemen here in the vest. Yeah, using the mic. Um, I'm interested in the role of reading in prison, education in prison, in developing uh, political and social consciousness and leadership abilities. So uh, we put on our Facebook, uh, there's a leader, very respected person in Chicago named Frank Chapman, and he just finished his memoir as he did a short summary about the role in organizing the, uh, in the Missouri prison system uh, for years, uh, the reading group and how they challenged, so they ended segregation within the Missouri prisons, uh, got literature access that was being denied, et cetera. And uh, I know there's a very good article on, on Malcolm X's uh, education and commitment to education that's a person from the Bard program put out. But I'm just wondering, any comments you have, either more on Malcolm or on the role of developing le leadership within the prisons and when people get out, if they have access to some decent education and literature? Uh, 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 well, leadership and reading in the prison. What people fail to discuss about Attica is that when they went on lockdown, they passed around books. They passed around George Jackson, Blood in My Eye, Solidarity Brothers. So they read, everybody read that whole lockdown. And when they got off, they was fired up. They was fired up. After Attica is when they said we need to do something, and which was what? Give them TVs and radios. Mm -hmm. TVs and radios, I heard one officer said we had to have three to four uh, officers to a gallery. Now all we got is one. Because TVs and radios babysit them. Those who do the most reading are the most likely to file a grievance for an issue. They are most likely to file, bring a lawsuit in the court and all that. And, and when it comes to like Supermax, some people are there generally just for filing grievances. And, 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 and you can help somebody else file a grievance and you a target. So, right, reading and activism and all that. I'm talking about once you read so much, you can't do nothing else. Once the cloud gets full, it can't do nothing else but rain. So that's what happened. Look. And, and can I only add to that? There's a problem generally without this work, which is that the prison is supposed to define everything. The prison is supposed to sort of explain everything. Yeah. You know, you people ask me a question, or people I'm sure ask you this question. Does studying in prison change you? Studying changes you. Does going to college in prison change you? No. Going to college changes you. Does reading a book in prison change you? No. Reading a book changes you. Does sitting around with five guys or five women and reading a book together change you? Of course it does, regardless of the fact that it's in the prison. So the politicization and significance of the prison is real, but let us not have it sort of distort the humanity of all learning, of the relationship between leadership and, and litigation and political organization, and all learning and talking. Hey, hey, I, like, I like to speak to this point for real, for everybody. Please don't do this if you know somebody been in prison, they out, or whatever. Mm. When I got out of prison, and what frustrated me most, only thing people want to talk about is before you went in, mm -hmm. and when you went out, and when you came out. And they said, that was then. You out here now. I'm talking about what, I died? Did I go there and die? You know what I'm saying? Right, I read, did I die while I was in there? So, as my wife know, I told somebody, okay, since you won't, don't want, she, that's another prison story. I was there for 24 years. I'm talking about, of course. Mm -hmm. I said, look, we ain't gonna talk about none from May 13th, 1989 to May 2nd, 2013. I'm not gonna talk about absolutely nothing, and I don't wanna hear none from you either. I don't want to hear the sunshine. <laughs> I don't want to hear you had a baby. I bet these years better come up missing in your life, like you want them to come up missing in mine. Uh, thank you. Uh, one last just thing we should note to tie it to the Second Chance Pell. There were two leading advocates in American higher education who were at the forefront of the return of, second, of, the, of the Obama administration's uh, Second Chance Pell money, Vivian Nixon and Glenn Martin. 
Uh, they are both leaders of organizations in New York. Glenn Martin is just leadership. Uh, they are both formerly incarcerated people, and they both went to college while they were in prison, and they're two of the most successful educational activists in the country, uh, regardless of topic. All right, so I think that's another, speaking to the Missouri example, the gentleman in the sweater in the back and then in the black shirt in the front, uh, one row up and then. Yes, my name is Troy. <clears throat> I'm a member of Expo. Uh, kind of opposite of what James just said. I use my experience uh, talking to these young guys. Uh, I live over near, in, I live in a hood. So near 27th Atkinson, there's a, there's a liquor store and there's a lot of young guys hanging out with their pants sagging, smoking weed, uh, you know, gambling. I got a 16 year old that I mentor, he's at Hamilton High School. So I share what it's like to be locked up during the holidays, away from your family, during Christmas, having a birthday, uh, not having, uh, you know, to go out and do something for your 21st birthday if you're locked up, uh, or spend your 18th birthday behind bars. I like to put that emphasis so maybe it'll, it'll impact them, but it, lately it's not working. I got a text that was disturbing this morning uh, from one mom, and she said, uh, she said, Troy Jordan uh, got caught at school with weed, and I text back, I said, they're gonna try to expel him. She said, I know legal action is gonna take his case. He has a hearing on Wednesday. He's only 14, he's in the eighth grade. And the 16 year old that I mentored, his mom said that he's been skipping school. Uh, he hasn't been attending. He's been lying to me about going to his math tutor. And so the only thing I'm thinking about is how this pipeline works. And this is how it works. These kids are failing in our public schools and nobody gives a damn about it. I was at North Division High School at the event last night and these kids are walking around. All these young 15, 16 year olds, I say, young man, pull up your pants. Everybody's walking around with their pants, one hand around their belt loop, and they're pulling their pants up. I said, where, oh, oh, I'm old school, I'm sorry. I said, so I asked the teachers, why don't you guys enforce them? She said, well, we try to make them. What do you mean you try to make them? Why don't you kick their ass out the door? If they can't come in with a belt, send them home. How can you educate these kids if you can't run the classroom? That's, this is how it works. They don't care about our kids. They don't care. The police come up. I, I saw the police van, the police car. I said, what are all these police doing here? Oh, they come every day. Why do they come here? Because they're getting them indoctrinated to this atmosphere of police around them. They start early. They handcuff them at 7. They expel them. They kick them out. The teachers don't care about them. The, and uh, the lady said, well, you know, we have kids in foster care. We got some are homeless. Some have been molested. They're angry. They got all these issues. How can they study? They're, of course they're gonna end up in prison later on with all these issues. So uh, Mark Rice knows, he, he, uh, I, I sit in the Expo Project Return meetings and I talk about all the efforts that they're doing for uh, you know, fighting the system and changing the justice system. Yeah, but what about catching them early so they don't have to end up incarcerated? That's where my emphasis is. Hey, I, 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 I'd like to say something to that. First of all, I'm talking about uh, they was wearing suits, I'm talking about nice suits, in the 50s and the 60s, and they still had, or whatever before, they still had Jim Crow. I'm talking about, so the, the pants and that ain't that. It's just years of stigmatization. No, uh, but, that's, but hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And your pants are hanging down below, below your knees, you're not gonna get hired. The only thing you can do is sell weed. That's all you can do is sell crap. They sell weed. If you can't pull up your pants, nobody's going to give you a chance. They say they told me in prison. I took a convict criminology class at Oshkosh University, and they had an outgoing pre-education class uh, re-entry. They said that the employer looks at you, and the first seven seconds, they're, they're deciding whether or not they're even going to give you a chance. So you walk in there with a dress shirt, a smile, a handshake, a firm handshake, and if you're looking at your pants behind your knee, how can you even have an opportunity? That's what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, I'm talking about, I study a little criminology too. I know about <laughs> the corner boy, what you talking about, man's ray, hey, 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 the whole thing. Like I said, once again, when we was wearing suits in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, we still went in and didn't get a job, so now what? So, and then uh, about uh, the teachers, the teachers don't have much power. The only power they got is to call the parent. Now, if the parent ain't involved, that ain't our fault. I'm saying, that ain't the teacher's fault. And I only think the principal's got too much power now. They got to call central office right now to suspend one kid, and that's why. Because the thing between charter school and public school, they trying to keep some people in the seats. They trying to keep some people in the seats. So they trying to, first, and that's the one, the other, other thing, a zero tolerance, 
which was uh, at first, we said that everybody suspended everybody. That didn't work. Now to the other pendulum. Look, we ain't trying to suspend nobody. We want to keep the uh, kids in the seat. We, try, we want to keep the seat so we can get economics. The funding from the public versus going to the charter school. You know what I'm saying? Once again, and then, right, that little man uh, or little Derek father is not there. Why? Because he's in the prison. And nobody is, like, really caring about the whole community. They look in this in uh, compartments, compartments. You know what I'm saying? But if, man, it's compartments. And I, I, look, I think it's the same thing like the drug epidemic, heroin. Only until it reached the suburbs, now it's an epidemic. Crack been killing us for the longest. Uh, but it's never been, we need to change the laws. They need to get help. It's been punishment, punishment, punishment. Now vote for me. Thank you. Hey, look. <laughs> uh, if I can just add to that, um, I, I hear what you're saying about this idea of self-presentation and soft skills, those things are important. But I couldn't agree with James Moore that there is a context here. The context of Milwaukee is that Milwaukee is the most racially segregated city in the United States. If the kids that you've encountered were to pull up your pant, their pants, I don't think that would change. 530206 is the most incarcerating zip code in this state, which has the highest rate of black incarceration in a country which has the highest black, which has the highest incarceration rates in the world. I don't think people pulling up their pants is going to change that fact. And so while I hear what you're saying, I think what, and I, this is where I would agree with James, is that there's structural factors that aren't, that's not linked to a self-presentation. There's structural factors that deal with racial animosity, racial prejudice, racial discrimination in America. And to really address those issues, I think that requires um, shifting the focus away from uh, the street corner youth that you're really talking about and focusing instead the attention on the way that um, our institutions are ran, who holds positions of power, and the ways in which our institutions just aren't working the way that perhaps they should. Yeah, I have a comment and a question. The, the comment uh, is concerns the MITC program. Um, I've taught both online for many years. Mike, are you using the mic? Push your button. I've taught uh, both online and in person for many years. And I think my experience is that the in-person education is far superior because you have real human interaction between the faculty and the students. I didn't teach in prison doing that. I did teach years ago uh, in prison on something called TV college, which I considered a far inferior form of education. They watch television shows and then they could call into me once a week. Uh, that isn't the same as sitting in a room and having a real conversation. And that's true uh, in the classroom here. Now, I know that at the college, we do some online teaching for expediency's sake for the students. I had a nursing student. I asked her one time, why are you taking it this way? And she's got a child. She's got a job. She's got to take economics. She doesn't really care about economics. And so I understand that we offer it for that reason, convenience. But you go to McDonald's for convenience. You go to the University of Wisconsin, or you come to MATC to get an education. So that's my comment. I think that it seems to me that uh, from listening to this discussion, uh, if it's at all possible for this college to send faculty into the prisons, they should go there on the, that's the turf of the, of the prisoners. And conduct the classes there where you can have real interaction and not one other factor. And uh, I think a lot of people in here know I'm running this emergency economic fund. A lot of the students who are, not, who are 
not on the inside, that are on the outside, have very great difficulty using computers. There's a myth at this college that everybody knows how everybody is in the digital era because they have smartphones. They come into our office all the time now with their smartphones and they can't fill out the applications for the DreamKeepers uh, funding. So to think that people on the inside have these great computer skills that will allow to have a really dynamic class, I think is we're, we'd be deceiving ourselves. If, so that's, that's my pitch. Uh, my question is uh, on the Pell that, we, that METC evidently has, uh, are there threats to that politically uh, under the Trump administration, or is that money secure? It's my feeling that it's secure. We got our annual uh, allotment, and I guess we'll only know year by year, but I don't know if you have anything more to offer. I'll put it this way. At Bard, where we have a lot of, we have 100 and some students funded through that program, it'll be more next year. Uh, we budget as if it uh, could disappear at Betty DeVos's whim or the president's whim. Uh, and we do that in the interest of continuity for the students because uh, as bad as it is to not have a college and prison, it's even worse to put it in and take it away. So we build for stability, and, but that's a luxury we have. And I don't know if MATC would have the luxury to no. think and organize money strategically that way outside of conventional budgets, and therefore don't, just do what you can. But I would, I would do so with, with a sense of, um, you, know, uh, you know, concern about that. Uh, the only thing I, you know, the, the original budget, I think, went for three years. Uh, that's how long they project those budgets out. Uh, it's ostensibly legislatively for five years. We don't really know. Uh, but again, I would strongly encourage the, the college uh, to proceed as best it can, you know, on the, in the face of that uncertainty, knowing that it is, in fact, an uncertainty. Um, <clears throat> and look, I, I, I think Pell, Pell can be a slush fund for private, for for-profit for, for, for colleges to exploit. It's a lot of money. Everyone wants to belly up to the bar. And the last administration, I think, did a fairly good job shutting down for-profit colleges that were a scam. The thing that makes me remotely optimistic about Second Chance Pell surviving for the five years is that the Pell money could be there for for-profit colleges to exploit, and therefore there may be a larger structural <laughs> advantage to not messing with it. Yeah. I think that's what optimism looks like today. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, the gentleman in the back with the tie and then the woman here. In the back. All right. So um, as an advocate for higher education, um, I'm definitely proud that we have the second chance pale going into um, the prison systems. And we taking that initiative to help bring solutions in that area. As a student therapist, I have some concerns as far as mental health care for inmates and uh, the fact that a good percentage of inmates go undiagnosed. And the unfortunate thing, especially in Wisconsin, um, Milwaukee, and, and throughout the country as well, is that the criminal justice system seems to be the first line of defense for most individuals who struggle with mental, uh, mental health concerns. Um, Dontre Hamilton, if you uh, guys can remember, was an individual who dealt with schizophrenia. And if you know anything about the laws, you won't really receive any type of treatment until you become a threat to yourself or a threat to someone else. And so that's how you end up with police officers showing up on the scene um, ready to engage yeah. without real accurate training, without empathy, um, and really knowing what to do with someone who really even isn't a, a true threat. Um, I believe that media and some other avenues have really painted a poor picture of those who deal with mental health uh, concerns that uh, most mental health uh, patients or those who deal with that are somehow chronically violent. 
um, when that couldn't be further from the truth. Usually it's about roughly between three and five percent of uh, individuals who deal with mental health concerns are actually of some danger to themselves or someone else around them. And so um, when we look at, um, you know, lawyer representation, when we look at judges who are, uh, you know, assigning or, or, you know, giving years to uh, individuals who really need more support. And even when, um, uh, James, right? Yeah. James, when you talk about um, being isolated within the prison system, I can't help but feel like there is a certain level of depression that may be linked to that or a certain levels of anxiety that may be linked with that when it comes to being disconnected. Um, and even to Mike's point, in sending an actual instructor into the room, we're talking about reengaging with more human connection, which helps us feel more normal, um, which I could see through things like work release and getting out into the society as you're talking about reentry to bring back that level of homeostasis or normal um, that you had before going in. And so I wonder what kind of health care is being administered to the inmates while they're in there to help re-stabilize and rehabilitate in that respect um, in conjunction, supplemental to the education that we're doing. Hi, I'd like to say something about that. Uh, I was told when I first got locked up, like even before my conviction, that after five years, a depression used to sit in for everybody in prison. You know what I'm saying? So it's like always a great, cl a great cr cloud over the prisons. I'm saying you watch it when people go get on the phone and nobody answers the phone call, but they come back and you act like you didn't even see it. You know what I'm saying? When mail call came again and they didn't get mail again, you know, because when, when mail used to come at the same time every day. And 30 minutes before mail is quiet, and 30 minutes after the mail is quiet. 30 minutes before you anticipate if I'm going to get some mail before. 30 minutes after, either you reading your mail or recuperating from not getting none again. You know what I'm saying? And then the conversations start. Uh, in jail, you're talking about the isolation. In jail, a lot of, uh, of us go through an identity crisis. Because when you come there, they take everything and then give you their stuff. Uh, so, you know, people used to define themselves by their clothes, by their family, by their friends, where they from. But when you get there, it's absolutely right. All that may be gone. I'm saying you might got one or two friends left, your mama, your sister, brother, every now and then. So now you guys got to say, like, who am I? You know what I'm saying? Who am I? First of all, you had the stuff to define you to say, so-called define you who you were. Now you got to get to the bare bones, you know what I'm saying? Who am I? And, you know, that's the identity crisis, that's the self-worth, you know what I'm saying? You're trying to uh, figure out self-worth, identity, and a whole lot of stuff be going on at that time until, you know, you, you kind of like get a grip, but you never really get a grip of it. Uh, and then the next thing is, you know, and, you know, I, I'm not a police guy at all, but, you know what I'm saying, look, but, but I have to say this, the police gave too many hats to wear. You know what I'm saying? Here you go, you just, re, uh, you just responded to a homicide, and you just seen somebody shot up, and the body is crucial. Then they send you to a Don Train Hamilton. You still ain't deprogrammed yourself from the murder. Or you sweating somebody over Lucy's, loose cigarettes. I'm saying, how you go from a, a homicide to lose cigarettes or responding to domestic violence or whatever. And you got to just keep this stuff. And you got to, so I'm saying they spreading too thin. I feel like the police spreading too thin with all these laws they just create. Say, go do this, go do that. They should have like special, and then another thing about that, the people who police our neighborhood, not from our neighborhood. No, and they will fight against that truth and nail. They from Wauwatosa. Was Alice all the way out there? Nice homes, no problem, and they don't even know us. So right, it's this, this, the other. You know what I'm saying? It's this fear of the other. Malcolm X said the character assassination come before the bullet, mm -hmm. and the media had character <laughs> character assassination us ever since I remember. And somebody used to call me Jamaican when I was there. We gonna have a fight when I was young. Call me Jamaican again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So right, this, 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 the other, this. They nothing. It's the sagging pan. I'm still a human being. You forgot? 
I'm just like you. And the same thing go through jail. They, I'm talking about everybody sell look the same, everybody wearing the same. They think if everything uniform, then you will conform. Physically, no problem. But mentally and soul in my spirit, I, I can't do it. Uh. I'd like to know whether you all feel that the time in prison could be could be used better by the people who are running the prison, and so that the people will be re more ready for reentry. And what would happen if the people who ran the prisons were held responsible for their own recidivism rates? Uh, that'd be like the big political football. Because, you know, even where I was at, when the parties changed from a, a Republican to Democrat, <laughs> the wardens, they all knocked off. You know what I'm saying? Look, they all knocked off, most of them, if they won. Okay, it, it, it changed with, with Bogorovich. When Bogorovich came, y'all know him, the governor mm -hmm. of Illinois. <laughs> yeah. When he became governor, all the Republican uh, uh, wardens, they got knocked down. They, they went to something else. The captain, someone went to sergeant, someone went to, I'm saying, they just, they just lost. And everybody else who was Democrat, they got put in their positions. You know what I'm saying? So it's always like a political football. Even prisons, it's, it's, it's a political football. And then to go back to you talking about mental health. I'm talking about a, a, a lot of this, this isolation. Everybody just want to sleep. <laughs> they say, hey, look, can you give me something? Well, I can't give you none. You ain't trying to hurt yourself or nothing. I'm saying, then they act out. Just give me something so I can sleep. You know what I'm saying? And then, like, I was in county jail. They said that's the biggest county jail in the world. But it's the biggest mental <coughs> facility, too. Because in the wintertime, I'm saying, they said, look, they go do something crazy to get locked up and treated. That's the only way. Why I got to get locked up and get some medication? I'm saying, why you can't provide for that out here? <coughs> why, why I got to get locked up to get this? So, and that's that. <laughs> um. I'll just say, I, I, I don't like the first question, and I do like love the second question. Meaning, uh, again, I'm, 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 I, would, I, I'm not, a, I don't think progress has to do with empowering, you talk about many hats for the police officers, I don't think progress here looks like empowering people in corrections to do more. Uh, so, you know, I think you, we might change that question by saying, how do we get, you know, our public health infrastructure, such as it is, uh, direct in? How do we get our primary health care direct in? Uh, right? I mean, how do we bring the food in from the outside? How do we bring the, the, the faculty and the instructors? It, it has to do with creating a more porous environment in which the best of what we might have available as resources can go there rather than, you know, there will be a push uh, to, to create more correctional education, uh, which is a, to education what correctional health care is to health care or correctional mental health is to mental health. It's like that joke about military music, you know, and military justice. That, that's, it's not, we want to steer away from amplification of the system as we change it. That said, your other point is really radical and we need it in all areas of life. So you're talking about an internalization of cost. You're basically, you know, which we don't have in our economy at all. There's no internalization of cost in the United States economy. I mean, almost none. We dump everything. Uh, and, I, and that's how I think of what you're saying, which is, you know, this is, speaks to her question. You know, should people in corrections be, be on the hook, professionals, for the rates of recidivism in their institutions? Sure. Should our district attorneys be on the hook for false conviction? Yeah. But they're not. They're not. Right? I mean, what's the internalization? What's the risk there? The risk reward there for the actor, the individual actor, is completely perverse because there is no consequence. We but, talk about a system of consequences. These are completely, you know, there are no consequences. But so. society look at us as the other. They still, like, even you trying to tell them, don't frame it as like uh, getting educated or activism in prison. We still the other. They don't look at us as far as part of the community as right. well. We live right down the street from y'all. Right. But, right, but I'm saying we are the other. I agree with that. I would only complicate it slightly. Uh, a great book to read would be James Foreman Jr.'s, the son of James Foreman. James Foreman Jr., a uh, recent book came out called Locking Up Our Own. He was a, it's a case study of the District of Columbia during the period of which Julia's book is about, uh, this, the, the turn to mass incarceration. And the district attorney in D.C. 
when James Foreman is a public defender who's locking up all the kids of DC is Eric Holder. It is a, it's an, it is, it is the, 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 our country's capacity to other each other, don't underestimate it, is all I'm saying, right? So Foreman is writing a book about the, the, the cleavages and the, the, the external <coughs> forces on the African American community, driving it to participate in the systems of mass incarceration, which complicates the story, which is a, you know, a brutal and interesting book, Locking Up Our Own, it's called. Um, and then look at this country's capacity in the, in the states with the, the states, that, some of the states with the highest rates of incarceration are with the smallest number of ethnic minorities incarcerated. I mean, right? So our ability to, you know, just other the poor, just to treat, but, the, treat, well, but, but, yeah. But that, that, that reminds me of the social conflict theory. You know what I'm saying? The social conflict theory, the, the people in power, they try to stay in power. I'm saying they define yeah. the laws, they, they write the laws, they enforce the laws, and all that, and everybody else is a deviant. You know what I'm saying? And then, <laughs> but they tell you if you act like us, if you conform, then you'll be first class citizen too. It didn't happen to the Indians, it didn't happen to the Aborigines, and it ain't happening to us. You know what I'm saying? It ain't happening to us. And what happened, Do You do two things. You either explode or implode. What they do, after you go out time and time again, OK, I'm, I'm dressing like you want me to dress. I'm talking like you want me to talk. I go for a job. Uh, well, we'll call you. Uh, we'll call you. So what that do? You go back home. You feeling less than a man to your wife. I'm talking if she still want to be your wife. Because I'm saying you ain't feed nobody. Because the government will take care of her. All she got to go do get a quest card. Now you out the game. You ain't give her housing, all this type of stuff. So you go. So then you start drinking. You start drinking. Then you start everything else. Every other stress, domestic violence. So now you imploding instead of exploding. Or you explode. You go out and do hurt somebody. You go out and do crime. And, and, and it's like that. And uh, it's, I'm talking about it, 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 it's, it's the social conflict theory. You keep telling us to be like you. You keep telling us to act like you. You keep telling us we have this piece of paper. But still in all, it just don't happen. People just only. Uh, you know, right. They, they, they only hire people that they, they feel comfortable with, a lot of times look like them or serve a purpose. I believe an application is only for surplus. You know what I'm saying? Well, we, gotta, we just need somebody. Everything else by referral. You know what I'm saying? Every, everything else by referral. And one thing, one thing I would like everybody to, to, to think, I was in HOC for a minute, and uh, the House of Correction, the House of Correction, and, and I was appalled by, I couldn't find no books to read. Like, where are the books? They said, man, we can't get no books. Our people can't send us no books, magazines, or nothing. Only you got, you got to write the publisher. Who writes a publisher for a book? So if, here I am. I said, I've never been in a prison without books. Nobody got books. Where's the books? And they acting crazy in there. They don't got, I'm saying, right. Who, I'm talking about who kills this First Amendment right for your family to send you books? It's a story I know. Another story, I read a book. Hey, look, it was a guy, he was in, in prison. It was doing a takeover or something. So they said he didn't complain about the beating. He didn't complain about the food. He didn't complain. But when they took his pen and paper and his books, he said, now you locked me up. Now you put me in prison. And that's how I felt in HOC, really, really in prison. All right, thank you. I'm going to suggest we. Maybe one more question? Yeah, I would love to hear something from, from Larry. Also from, from Mr. Cote. Sure. No, I was just going to comment uh, about the part of your question regarding programming. And it sort of ties into the discussion that, that we've been having here about you know the institutional power and how it impacts outcomes. Okay. And one of the distortions that often occurs with programming is that it's used against individuals. Yes. I, I mentioned earlier that um, one of the things that FCAP was working on is reform on re uh, revocations here in Wisconsin. Uh, for those that don't know, it's an administrative process that happens here. The individual that's being revoked, meaning their privileges of release are being taken away. Um, they don't have a they have a right to an attorney, but they don't get a full court hearing on this. They're held in the county lockup or wherever that individual happens to be held. And the state is represented, and then the individual can have a private attorney or, more typically, a state public defender appointed attorney. And, what, and I've done 
cases like that. And one of the things that you will hear as a justification to the administrative law judge is, we need to revoke this person because guess what? We got programming to deal with whatever his problem or her problem is. So there's this unintended consequence of saying that the programming exists, it becomes the most secure and best place to carry out this programming, whether it's you know, AODA counseling or domestic violence or anger management or whatever, and they'll use that as a justification in their argument to the administrative law judge successfully oftentimes, but that's why this individual needs to again lose their freedom, okay? And so the challenge obviously on the other side is to come up with ways in which you can put, cobble together a better program. And at one time, DOC used to sort of play this hide the ball game where they wouldn't tell you what they thought was an appropriate outside better program for your individual so that you could get an alternative to revocation. You would have to sort of um, guess at what that is, present it at hearing, and hope that that's where they were going with this. So yeah. there's really some unintended consequences. That's just a, a small example of how the power in the institution distorts what should be a benefit to the individual that's being held. So I, I just wanted to comment. That's a great point. That's a great point. And, so, and yeah. No, I, I actually was just, I wanted to make sure we got to right. his question over there. I, 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 I completely agree that people should get degrees in college. And Wisconsin make it super hard. You know, I was there for nine years and couldn't take one class. But I feel like y'all are, are missing a, a big step because most of these guys don't even got high school diplomas. You know, 1,200 people in Green Bay, and they did what? 10. 10. 10, 10 HSEDs last year. You know what I'm saying? So y'all got all this Pell Grant money to give these guys college educations, but there's 10 people that can partake. And of those 10 people, how many are Green Bay going to let? You know, so it, 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 I feel like, like a, a crucial step is being missed by jumping into secondary education so, so fast. You, you know, when, when, like he was saying, most of these dudes getting snatched out of school. I, I went to prison at 14, came home at 23. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. they, they're getting snatched out of high school. I got my HSED in prison. You know what I'm saying? So, like, and I'm one of the 10. You know what I'm saying? So, like, well, like I, I feel like that's something that, that, that re really has to be addressed on a, on a large scale. I'll just very quickly agree with you uh, up to the point that, uh, I am in certainly no way advocating college and prison as a solution to mass incarceration, as a solution to the grievous inequalities of access to higher educational opportunity around the country, mm -hmm. uh, or as a way to smash this system that's sucking up so many of our children. Um, so uh, I would agree with you on all those points. It isn't any of those things. Uh, it is something that our colleges and universities need to do. That doesn't mean the state of Wisconsin doesn't need to cut, it. what is the, your goal currently? Well, cutting the, uh, cutting uh, the rate of incarceration? Into, New York State has cut its prison population by 30%. Uh, you should go for 50%. And that involves keeping kids in school. And that involves, uh, you know, in Vermont, where I was with state senators last week, the, they had a bill to just to, to end to, to end expulsions from schools to keep children at school, and the pushback came from the teachers' union. <clears throat> Wanted the power to expel the children, so we have deep problems here, and you're addressing, you're speaking to them, and I I, I, I am an advocate for this work because it's one of it's where I happen to be. I'm in a, I'm in a college. We ought to do this, but you're quite right. Um, it's broader and much deeper. No, like, first of all, what he said, teachers want the power to expand. They the first responders. They right there. They see the teachers. You know what I'm saying? Mandela said, I read his book, Long Walk to Freedom. He said, the most, the most important person in the prison is not the warden. It's whoever your gallery officer, because he see you the most. He going to be reporting. And he'll be able to respond to you if you get sick or anything or if you need something. You know what I'm saying? He the most important person. So I figure, like, teachers, having the power, I'm saying they know, you know, power corrupt, absolute power corrupt, absolutely, like I said. But, right, it need to be something, they the first one to see it. You go get to an administration who is far removed from the situation, and, and right, now they ain't, like I said, they ain't really, uh, they not really ex expelling no kids now. You know what I'm saying? And kids, mm -hmm. they know that, and they running rapid, they saying anything they want, mm -hmm. and they doing anything they want. 
Another thing I got to say is about the GED. Every prison I went to offer GED. Every prison don't offer college. So I'm saying, it's, I'm telling you, you got to start out here with the initiative of why is it important to go to school, not just to get good grades. I'm saying, my little brothers, I told them, my mother told me they was messing up. I told them, look, if you, get a, if you don't get a high school diploma, this is how much you probably make every year. If you do, this is how much you might make every year. If you get a social degree, this is how much you may make. If you get a, a bachelor's and a master, what you want? So right, it's, it's, it's the opportunity cost of going to school or not with all the other social ill problems we have when they get to school, like the brother was talking about. So right, it take, it's, it's taking more, it's, it, it, it's, we need everybody at that point blank. Well, and I can um, also, I'm sorry, I can also let, let you know that uh, at least at the Films Cheney Center here in Milwaukee, the minimum security prison that's up on Fond du Lac, um, when FCAB was more directly connected with them, they in fact did advocate and obtain HSED program within the facility along with a part-time teacher to facilitate that. And the success rates were pretty good up there. So there is some good news there. Hold on, one thing I, I got to add, it's very important before I leave, very, very important, is the role of the religious communities, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, I'm saying, because my, mosque where I go to, they have been very influential in trying to be, help me navigate this out here. Uh, support, what have we? I have been there, they have been uh, the re-entry program, so to say. And like, we do other things with other faith communities, the Christian community, the Jewish community, um, and, and that. I, I, I would, did not want to leave here without highlighting the, the 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 importance and the support of the religious communities in this uh, in this society in this in the, yeah here in Milwaukee. James, thank you. Uh, Larry. An MCM production.